Thank you for listening to The Luminous Mind. Remember to subscribe to our free podcast so you won't miss any of our illuminating content. Here is episode 201. No matter where we choose to send our children to school or how we choose to educate our kids, let's all work together and not in fight because we are all in it together fighting for each other's rights to educate our kids. Benjamin Franklin once said, Do not curse the darkness, rather light a candle instead. If you're ready to set your mind on fire, then prepare yourself for the Luminous Mind with your host, Rebecca Bowman. Today's fire starter is Vicki Alger. Vicki is a research fellow at the Independent Institute in Oakland, California, and the author of the book, Failure, the Federal Miseducation of America's Children. She holds senior fellowships at the Fraser Institute, headquartered in Vancouver, British Columbia, and the Independent Women's Forum in Washington, D.C. Alger is the president and CEO of Vicki Murray and Associates in Scottsdale, Arizona. She's also the proud Navy wife and stepmom of four boys, ages 12 through 18. Welcome, Vicki. Thank you. It's my pleasure. I could have read so much more about her. You can find out more about her on the independent.org, her personal page, which I will definitely link in our conversation. And I'm so excited to talk to you about your book, Failure, the Federal Miseducation of America's Children, as well as your work in educational policy studies. But before we get into any of that, can you please tell our audience a little bit more about yourself? Well, sure. I originally didn't start out to become an education policy researcher. I had gone to school to become uh, a university professor. And as I was finishing up um, my doctoral thesis at the wee hours (laughs) of the morning (laughs) one night, I saw this ad. I'm an Arizona native. And I saw an ad from the Goldwater Institute, which is a pro-parental choice and education organization in Arizona. And they never have job openings. And they had a job opening for uh, an education policy director. And I thought, well, for hoots and giggles, why don't I apply? I think I can do that. So that was about 15 years ago. And I was very happy to get the job. And since then, um, I've been doing policies to empower parents over their children's education at all levels, preschool through high school, and also working on how to make college more affordable for everybody. So I've been working on those sorts of issues for almost 15 years now. So that's very exciting. I started off in the practitioner side, moved to the policy side. And um, that was before I got married. And it was always such a passion of mine because Parents know and love their children best. Nobody should be putting barriers between a parent and their children's education. And so then later in life, I got married to my wonderful husband, David, who just recently retired from the Navy, very distinguished veteran. And in marrying my husband, I also I now have four amazing stepsons who are all school age. So it's no longer just an academic issue for me. It's a very personal issue for me. We, we live with this fight every day. Yeah, that's great. Well, and I want to kind of hear a little bit more about like your personal views of, you know, this journey of how you you're led to discover what you do now with choice, uh, school choice advocacy. Was it something that you thought, oh, well, this will be a great way for me to, you know, just you just come into it with the Goldwater Institute? Or were there (laughs) already some inklings of like having a love for choice and education? I think it started for me once I was in college and well, even before then, because growing up, you basically had two choices, your neighborhood district school or a private school. If you know, you were fortunate to come from a a family who could make the sacrifices to afford both of those options. So as a child, I always struggled with school never being the right fit for me. And that continued on until college until I went to Thomas More College of Liberal Arts in New Hampshire. And I saw such great examples of what excellent teaching could be. It was finally the right fit. And it changed my life forever. My, I was originally going to be an international lawyer. And then I wanted to become an academic. I went to graduate school for that. And then it led me into the policy path. So 
a great education that works for you is life changing. And I think just, I was so fortunate to have those opportunities. I don't see why there should be barriers for anyone else. Why should parents be prevented? That really led me to where we are today. And this, the, I don't like to use the term school choice because educational choice and parents' rights is so much broader than that. I think we're seeing a whole, there's a whole range of battles that we, we have to fight every day uh, to protect the rights of parents, not just in education, but the, the right to parent and bring your child up the way you believe is best. So those are, the, the battle has become much broader for me. I'm, I'm very hopeful. I think we're seeing great progress. But the, the battle's never over. We have to be very vigilant about protecting our rights to bring up our children and educate our children the way we think is best, not somebody else. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it helps in, uh, like you said, it's a broad range of topics that you could you could really talk about that, that yeah, they do include education, but it education can come from many different angles as well. So, but let's, <laughs> let's talk about those battles. You know, after 15 years, what are some of the challenges that you discovered in this advocacy? And what do you think you've learned from those? Well, I have to tell you that I'm a very proud Arizonan and Arizona is considered ground zero for parental choice and education. We got rid of assigning people to district public schools based on where they can afford to, to live back in 94. We have one of the most expansive uh, public charter school laws. We were the first state to have tuition tax credit scholarships, which unlike voucher scholarships, which are like Pell Grants for K-12 children used with government money, people here in Arizona can make contributions to scholarship nonprofit organizations that hand out scholarships to children so they can attend private schools if their parents wish. We have four of those programs now. We were also the first state to enact an education savings account program. So for eligible parents of eligible children, if they don't prefer public school education for the child, they let the state know and the state deposits at least 90 percent of what it would have sent to the public school into that child's ESA instead. So parents can use that money not just to pick this school or that school, but to buy curriculum, online courses, pay for testing fees, special education therapies, which is so critically important. And that those any leftover funds roll over from one year to the next, it really just empowers parents to decide not just where their children are educated, but how their children are educated. So here we, we're celebrating our 20th anniversary of our landmark tax credit scholarship program, yet opponents are using the same dusty old tired arguments that we've heard for decades. And so it's frustrating to hear arguments such as we're going to destroy public education, public education in the sense in terms of government funded education, because I think public education really encompasses all of us who are educated. That's no matter where you're educated, that serves a public good. But we're hearing the same old arguments. And now we're hearing from elected officials that, well, parents have enough choices. And that just makes my blood boil because you can't, you know, just drive, drive to the grocery store and you're probably going to see dozens and dozens of coffee shops or donut shops or something like that. Nobody's a problem with, you know, nobody's trying to limit how many donut shops or coffee shops there are. But when it comes to something that's so critically important as education, our elected officials, some of our elected officials want to tell us that we have enough choices. That's, that's unacceptable to me. So that's something that I find very, very frustrating but there is good news. There is hope. I think I like to think of it as the dying gasp of the of a dinosaur. Most states have non-public school parental choice. I'm very proud that Arizona has one of the best homeschooling laws. Homeschooling parents are left alone, unlike our our neighbors in California, where he, homeschooling isn't expressly protected. So there are some good things, but we there are still battles. 
Yeah. Well, you were talking about education being a public good. I mean, having a huge amount of varieties of education keeps the public better informed in a way. I mean, when we when we have one level of, you know, of where our information and the things that we learn are given, it is a great way for somebody who has ill intentions to attack our society. But when you have multiple ways that people are learning, it keeps everything in check. So that it's a, you know, it keeps that public very protected in a way. I definitely, I mean, there are so many things going through my head when you were talking about that. I'd love to hear more like educational savings accounts. You know, when I have talked about that with some of my homeschooling friends, they tend to shy away from that because they don't want the government involved. Like you said, I mean, you open the door to them coming into your home and then all of a sudden, you know, they're dictating everything that happens in that house. And of course, you know, a lot of the people against the ESAs might say, well, that's a good thing because then we're stopping abuse or we're stopping this or that. But you know, is oh. there, a, do you see a problem with that of, you know, if we accept the government money, do we have them, do we have, do we risk that happening for them to come into our homes and tell us how to use it? Well, I think every one of us has to be concerned about government overreach. And we can talk more about <laughs> the, the particulars of government overreach with your you know, book, shortly, sure. but <laughs> I, I certainly think we have to be uh, vigilant about it. When we're talking about a state level program, the reality is government is involved in education. Let's take homeschoolers, for example. I'm not aware of any state, and I'm happy to be corrected if I'm mistaken. I'm not aware of any state that says parents don't have to at least notify the state or there aren't some regulations about you have to make sure you're teaching your child this subject, that subject, and the other subject. You have to have some sort of a There's some sort of of government involvement. Let's look at non-public schools, uh, private schools. They have to be accredited. They have to be registered. So the state, my point in saying all this is that government is already involved. I don't know of a magic wand. We're not going to go back to the pre-1850s days when government left education alone. It was completely handled in the private family, philanthropic, religious philanthropic sphere. That's not where we are. So as much as we might like it to be, because this is in my book we did in the early days of the Republic, we were doing quite well. But that's not where we are. We we didn't get where we are overnight. It's not going to stop overnight. So I think we all appreciate that reality. With regard to ESAs, voucher scholarships, tax credit scholarships, they're voluntary. And as someone who has advised on policies like that, advised state lawmakers and multiple states for well over a decade, there are protections that you can put in place. Now, listen, we have to be vigilant about those protections, but there are protections that we have to, you know, we can put in place. What's critical for me is that no parent is ever forced to participate in one of these programs. So for example, we're in a battle royale right now here in Arizona, we just took our educational savings account program and made it, you know, anyone eligible up to 30,000 students. We put a cap on it. Only, thir you know, up to 30,000 students can apply. If homeschooling moms and dads don't want to use that money, then that's great. One thing I was not happy with, and once we get into politics, it's two steps forward, one step back. There are families who are desperate for additional education options, just desperate. And as someone who is, has a son with special needs, I know firsthand how terrifying it is when you need certain services and the costs are very high. We never participated in the ESA because the, the best option wasn't allowable under the program. But I have to tell you, I've heard from so many parents for whom this is a lifeline for their children. They want it. And so they're agreeing to, all right, we're going to test. We're going to do this. We're going to, we're, we're going to go along with all these quote unquote accountability measures. That's their choice for homeschooling moms and dads, parents who are sacrificing to pay out of pocket taxes as well. You know, taxes, not pocket tuition. They make the decision not to take a, an ESA or tax credit. That's their choice. But for me, we have to do the best we can to expand options to as many families as possible. And we all have to be vigilant to keep government 
you know, from overstepping its bounds. I wish there were a perfect solution that we had universal freedom, that our rights as parents were universally protected without government interference, but that's not where we are. But I do think these programs are lifelines for parents and I fight, (laughs) I fight every day to help, you know, help expand them while keeping government at bay. Yeah, I know I've talked about it before. I mean, one of the reasons why I had you on this podcast, even though we do talk a lot about homeschooling, is that we have to work together to move the needle, you know, to make progress so that there are more choices, so that people have the opportunity to be educated the way that they best see fit. And it just only makes sense that if we are spending our tax, I mean, these are, this is our money that comes from our pocket yes. that is the government is taking from us. But I mean, we've got to keep that in check that this isn't their money handing it back to us or giving it to us. It's our money that we want to get back to use for those certain situations. So I definitely, I mean, we talked about it before we even started recording that we're all in the same boat. You know, we're all here to help move the needle. And that's really the big difference of of what we're, and we're going to have some great conversations about the failures of our education system, but then what we can do to help make it better. But before we (laughs) kind of move into your book and some of your writing and things that you have done. Tell us, how do you feel like your paradigm on education has changed over time and with experience? I'm sure when you first got that first interview with the Goldwater Institute to now, it's vastly different. I want to hear about it. Well, I would say probably the, the biggest change for me started occurring. I started getting glimmers of, it's really the accountability, the way we discuss accountability and the whole issue of accountability. I started, you know, the the little hairs on the back of your neck start going up. That started happening probably in 2008 and certainly in 2009. Right around that time, we started to hear rumblings about Common Core. We'd already gone through years of the federal No Child Left Behind Act. And, oh, accountability means testing. When I first started out, the idea of testing seemed fine with me. I have no problem with testing because in my head, that's diagnostic. Parents need information that we can't necessarily because, you know, teachers, union leadership, rank and file teachers, you know, the in the trenches teachers are different, in my opinion. There was such an animus politically from people purporting to represent teachers about giving actual information to parents and even measuring how children are doing. I thought, well, OK, testing is going to be good. Parents are going to get some real information about how their children are doing. And I got to tell you, I really, I don't believe that parents are getting good information about how their children are doing. So I'm now a big, quote unquote, accountability skeptic, because for me, what accountability means is information that is first accessible, number two, accurate. But what's the point of that if it's not actionable? And that's where I think we fail. What good does it do a mom or dad for their child to take a standardized test, which let's face it, the standardized testing of, you know, people our age, our generation's day is a whole lot different than what's going on today. Yeah, we were back in the one test a year type of thing. (laughs) Yeah, even if that, but parents can't do anything with it. And I think once you see how politicized testing has gotten, so let's say you have this great test and it's, it's developmentally appropriate it's fully aligned with what's being taught. What most of the members of the public don't see is behind the scenes, state boards of education or other bodies at the state level sit there and decide behind closed doors, well, what counts as passing, what's called a cut score, a passing score. And you can have the greatest standards on paper, as we did in many states in the pre-Common Core era. But if you've got a test where answering less than 50% of the questions correctly is deemed passing, great. Everybody's passing, but that doesn't mean anybody's learning. So I've really, really rethought my position on accountability. I really don't trust the state testing regimes anymore. I don't think that's accountability. And I think we have to fully empower parents. Let's let parents, whether they're the educators themselves or their children attend a school outside the home, Parents and teachers have to be able to work together. So there should be diagnostics. We're a complete 180 from that. I I don't know how it, I've heard this from other states. You know, in the spring, we've got a window that spans six weeks when students could be tested under 
And in states like Arizona, we've rebranded Common Core twice. We still have Common Core. And so children are being subjected to these tasks and parents don't know a darn thing about it. We don't even know when the test is going to be conducted. So I think the best thing we can do is empower parents to say, I'm either happy with my child's progress, however you measure that, because parents know if their children aren't doing well. And if they're not happy, they don't get satisfaction. Parents are free to go to whatever education provider they think is going to get the job done. And that includes homeschool for me. Yeah. The interesting thing about the testing, like you said, I mean, a lot of times we don't even have information on it, but it's also being used to data mine our children, you know, to find out kind of their almost their political views. And the testing is really what has gotten so many people upset about Common Core is the the fact that there is kind of this data mining going on and this like kind of an alternative situation of why they're learning certain things. I mean, that's one of the reasons that I've heard of why people are so kind of turned off with Common Core. What are oh, your- absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And I'm, I'm really happy to work with grassroots moms and dads here in my home state and in others. The privacy issue, can you even imagine, and it, it, this is, you know, back to school season, And you can imagine with, you know, four kiddos in school, all the papers that come home for parental consent, you can't show a movie, you can't have a field trip, you can't watch the eclipse, you can't have a baked good in class without parents being notified. Yet the data mining, and this is something, my husband's a computer engineer, so all all the excuses for not notifying parents are just a bunch of baloney. And just having to fight for basic privacy rights for children and it's one thing that I, I find, it, it just makes makes my blood boil. You meet with a lawmaker, you go down to the legislature and testify. And most of us are taking time, you know, we're taking time away from family. We're taking time away from jobs to do this. We're not high powered, high paid lobbyists. And once they find out you're a parent, people, particularly folks, I've had this experience from some public school districts, look at you and you can see that they're, they're deducting about 10 to 20 points from your IQ. <laughs> yeah. And it's so infuriating. So we have to be very vigilant with the privacy and make sure that first and foremost, we educate ourselves. We educate our lawmakers because I I saw something today where it said most lawmakers think that data mining, they they don't think it's happening, but they think data mining is just like attaching cookies or something when you're web browsing. And it's particularly when we're going beyond academics were going into social emotional learning you know non-cognitive measurement how on earth do you measure that particularly i'm thinking you know at least two of my stepsons you know 12 and 14 would fail the behavioral because they they have a hard time sitting still they're they're active boys yeah so we we've got to be very careful about where we're going and it, it takes parents standing up and fighting yeah Definitely. Awesome. Well, obviously you're not with the Goldwater Institute anymore. You're actually, you're working with the Independent Institute. You know, tell us a little bit more about that association and then what information our audience can find there. The Independent Institute, we are a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization, and we're getting ready to celebrate um, our, our 30th anniversary. And we advance policies that promote a peaceful, prosperous, and free society based on individual the individual dignity of, of the human person. So we're really looking for solutions that empower people rather than we always turn to government and government has the solution for everything. Yeah, that can end up being a huge problem within our society if, if we put them at the solution of everything. So <laughs> yes, that's, that's great. And there's a lot of information um, just on her about page, just on her personal page of books and videos, as well as audio commentary briefings, all of those things that you can find on her personal page, which I will be sure to link. But I definitely want to start now maybe and hear about your book, The Federal or Failure, The Federal Miseducation of America's children. Some reason that's tongue tying me today. <laughs> For some reason it is. It is. <laughs> it is. It does and as the title of the book suggests, I wanted to, as we were approaching the 30 year anniversary of the U.S. Department of Education in 2010, I thought, okay, I went to school both before we had a U.S. Department of Education and then after. 
And I was thinking to myself, I, I really don't see any big difference. Um, so I started looking to the history of, you know, what did education used to be be like? What were the arguments, you know, long before we had a Department of Education, at the beginning of our country, the early days of our republic, and how we really, what were the arguments for U.S. Department of Education? Because what you know, you might be surprised to learn that the first time we enacted and where we established a Department of Education was back in 1867. It lasted for about one year before Congress defunded it, downgraded it, and shifted it from a department to an office to a bureau. And so this department was bounced around from one dark corner of the federal government to another until until the 70s where people didn't really talk about, oh, we had one of these before, and it was a dismal failure. But the reason was that we thought, oh, gosh, education is part of the national interest. Um, we're in a fight to the death with the Soviets, and the Soviets are getting ahead, and we're not doing well. So, you know, we need federal leadership, but we're going to still keep education local. So basically, the promises we were made for having a Department of Education were three. We're going to have better administration of all federal education programs. We are going to save money. And thirdly, and most importantly, student achievement is going to go up. I'm well, trying not to laugh at all those points. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's hard to keep a, keep a straight face. Okay. So let's, let's look at the better administration. We are now in 2017. We have had a U.S. Department of Education operational since 1980. How are we going to figure out if the administration of a program is better when we don't even have a definition of what a federal education program is, we don't. To this day, we do not. That's interesting. In fact, the Government Accountability Office, that's the official um, federal government watchdog, in 2010 tried to do a rating of how well government programs are doing. And when I went through that, that tool of theirs, Almost 90% of the programs were deemed ineffective, but that program had to be taken down because the definitions of education program were so varied, it wasn't considered accurate. Let's look at essentially how much we're spending as a country on education. The budget itself is just over $60 billion. President Trump has advocated slashing it by another 9.2. But what we don't commonly here reported is the nearly $160 billion we're spending every year on federal financial aid for college. We're not hearing about all the overhead, the administration, the salaries, and all of this. So we're spending hundreds of billions of dollars a year. And what do we have to show for it? If you look at the nation's report card and various international tests, before and after the U.S. Department of Education was founded, you're going to see a flat line. The only line that goes up is how much we're spending. In fact, we spend up to a third more per student than the, the world's top performing countries. So basically, American students are basically average. We have never been global leaders in ever, any subject. That's a myth we hear a lot. American students have always been squarely average. Where we're not average is in our spending. Where we are seeing great results, though, over the past couple of decades as more and more parental choice programs come online and the competition that brings, is we're seeing when parents are in charge, education improves. And that's something that's hugely encouraging. Yeah. Well, and I think this fits perfectly with your work with the Independent Institute of, you know, when we get government involved, you know, there there tends to be a ton of problems. We want to keep people independent and free. And let's kind of talk about, I mean, right now, the, the hearings with Betsy DeVos and all of those, I mean, there was people just like coming just totally unraveled at the thought that she wasn't squarely on board with the Department of Education. You know, we talked about it was created back in 1979. And from that point on, you know, the spending has gone up almost, what, 45, it's at a 45 degree angle, almost straight up. Uh, yes. In a way, and then the education has flatlined, obviously. So we get all these federal bureaucrats involved. We get the government back involved with the education, and we're not seeing the results. There are three points in your book that you talk about 
how we have failed in our education. Do you want to kind of talk about maybe more about the federal or the Department of Education? You know, its creation, you kind of went back of when we first started it, it was a dismal failure, but somehow we've kept it. And now we can't even think about not having it, even though it's only, you know, it's it's a 40 year old. I mean, it's not proving itself to be effective, basically. No. You know, give us I, uh, give us the background to that. Well, I think that, you know, most of us will remember the Department of Education. It, it, this is an open secret. This isn't some partisan bashing on my part. This was this is one of the biggest open secrets out there during the administration of President Jimmy Carter. He basically promised that in exchange for the National Education Association's endorsement, the NEA is uh, the country's largest teachers union. They had never endorsed a president before in their hundred some odd, I think it was at least a hundred year history at the time. So Jimmy Carter made it a priority towards the end of his administration to get a Department of Education. Now, there were some in Congress who had wanted a Department of Education for at least a decade, because we'll remember at that time, organiz- you know, reorganizing and reorganization and you know, restructuring government was was all the rage. If we just get the chairs on the Titanic placed properly, everything's going to be okay. Yeah. So, if you look at the votes in Congress at the time, this wasn't some vast left wing conspiracy. The Department of Education passed because a lot of Republicans voted for it too. Certainly in the House. So I think we have to, we we didn't have examples of the time of parental choice working. It was largely public schools. And when Reagan came into office, he promised to get rid of that, the boondoggle, as he called it, but he didn't. And there's a split in thinking that we are still seeing today that we can't leave a vacuum with education. Even those who favor parental choice in education say there has to be some experts involved. There has to be some quote unquote accountability. That's why I'm getting increasingly frustrated and angry by the direction the accountability movement is going in, because it's for me, it's now code with government meddling, even though it's the government is not shown to be effective. People, I think, at this point are afraid that if we don't have a U.S. Department of Education, that children will be denied access to schools, particularly the most vulnerable children. Historically, that's not true. It took acts of Congress for the public schooling system to accept children with disabilities. Public schools segregated for generations before you know, they were forced to do it. We could actually, with the exception of three programs, we could get rid of the Department of Education right now. We wouldn't have to, we wouldn't have to kill any programs. 90% of all of our State Department of Education's staff, in some cases, just handle federal mandates and federal programs. So you take all the federal programs that are now being administered in D.C., bring them back to the states. You know, when the money runs out, there's usually funding from one to five years. Citizens in the states decide, are these programs worthwhile? And if so, you know, we'll fund them or no, we don't think they're working. We're not going to fund them. The three exceptions I would make would be where Congress and the feds do have constitutional authority would be the D.C. Opportunity Scholarship Program. That's a D.C. voucher for children in failing, unsafe public schools, low income children. The second program, anything to do with veterans education, veterans affairs, that should be in veterans affairs. I'm not saying that's going to be a great solution for them, but we can only tackle one bureaucracy at a time. (laughs) The third program that we should keep is the Office of Civil Rights, but we move that to the Department of Justice. The Office of Civil Rights, as the name suggests, make sure that students' rights are being protected. So that's a legitimate working of federalism. So if things aren't working out in the states, you have recourse at the federal level. Other than that, everything can be turned over to the states for administration. And that's how we can get rid of the U.S. Department of Education in just a few steps without killing a single program. Yeah. Well, and that's what I mean, when you listen to some people, they act like getting rid of the department would cause this huge mayhem in education. But basically, from what I'm getting from what you're saying, and from what I've learned is that we send our money to Washington, it gets spent by bureaucrats. So first of all, you know, with high paying salaries, and those types of things Mm -hmm. to come around and turn around and tell us how to spend that, you know, they return it, but they spend the money. And a lot of times, aren't there like, you know, there's little things attached to it, like you can get this money, if you do these certain things that maybe aren't in the best interest of the students or the 
Is that correct? Or Oh, you hit the nail on the head. In fact, I call it, you know, we're basically being bribed with our own money. Yeah. And for perspective, for every dollar we send to Washington, D.C., we only get about a dime back wow. from the federal government. And that's tied with so much red tape that's often costly to take that federal money. In fact, I've met with um, superintendents of public school districts. Now, obviously, they're doing this off the record, but they say we can't you know, between Common Core and then the bathroom mandates and all these other mandates, they said, we can't, uh, yes, I know we get money. We can't afford the money. It costs us too much to accept this money. Before we go on, please listen to this message. Changing a paradigm takes some study, but like me, you are probably super busy. That's why we've teamed up with Audible. Go to our website, theluminousvine.net, Get a free month of Audible with two audiobooks, thousands of titles in exchange for only books that you absolutely love. You too can be learning on the go to keep that fire burning. federal miseducation of America's children. Well, and when I talk to my local leaders here, you know, when Common Core became a big thing and there was a big uproar about it, anytime you turn and talk to them, their hands are tied, basically, because they have to follow, you know, what the federal government's kind of telling them in order to get some of the money back. And then it kind of goes back to, you know, with your work with the Independent Institute that all of a sudden that they have no jurisdiction. They're basically, even though even though it's not supposed to be that way and everybody says, oh, well, all the local people are making the decisions anyway, in a, in a way, that's not the situation. You know, they have to abide by some of these mandates from the federal government. Is that right? Or? Oh, it, it, absolutely. And, and, and basically we have a completely dysfunctional dance of the lemons going on right now because on the one hand, it's a great scapegoat. I mean, nobody's oh, accountable, you know, <laughs> oh, it's a nice round robin of blame because you can go to your, you know, your, your, your school board meetings and say, where's the money going? You know, why isn't it going here, there and the, you know, the other, why are you spending it on this, you know, type of thing? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, they'll shrug their shoulders and say, we can, but it's a federal mandate. So, you know, you, you know, I don't know how, you know, what are you going to do? Call, you know, Betsy DeVos or the head of one of the departments and say, you know, basically, why is this happening? What's the money doing? Well, that's a local matter. We can't get our, get involved in that. So basically, where are you supposed, you know, where does the buck stop? In other words, there's no one that you can really go to and say, this is a problem. We elected you to do a job. It's always this round robin of blame. Oh, that's the state. That's the state legislature's fault. They're not giving us enough money. Well, that's the Fed's fault because they put too many strings on. And or it's the, you know, it's the local school board's fault for not voting the allocation that way. It's so mind numbingly and unnecessarily complex. If that's why it's so important, I, I think back to the suggestion, listen, people should be able to afford it, pay for your education, whatever kind of education you want. For those who can't, all right, then that's where public funds, it don't have to be government funds, that's where public funds can come in. And he advocated voucher scholarships. I mean, today, I think education savings accounts yeah. are a better way to go. If As long as we keep the government out of it. Personally, as a taxpayer, I trust parents way more than I trust politicians to educate their children well. Yeah. I was like, watching one of your videos and you talked about how, you know, with the educational savings accounts, there has been abuse and fraud, but it's a very, you know, it's a handful of people, a handful of parents. But then they think, well, you know, that kind of proves our point that they can't be trusted. But you look at the ways that our federal money is, I mean, millions and millions of dollars sometimes can slip through the cracks. Nobody knows where it's going. It can be embezzled or whatever. <laughs> you know, there's no accountability. We can't trust that them anymore than we can some of the parents or even less so. So 
Absolutely. And I trust. And what I like about ESAs is, as you said, that's a great point that we'll read these federal reports. And, you know, I'm reading the end notes, you know, millions, in some cases, billions of dollars. You look at these financial reports. We don't know what happened to it. Shrug shoulders. Yeah. And nobody's held accountable. The heads should be rolling. But with, with the ESA programs in my home state, and they, they operate similar similarly in other states. Five other states now have um enacted ESA programs. Basically, money is not distributed all at once. You get an upfront amount. And then you, just like most of us in our jobs, we file expense reports with receipts for verification. And that's done in real time. It's done, I think we're moving to monthly now, but it had been quarterly. Wow. So we're not catching these, you know, this misspending because there can be honest mistakes, misspending, then you correct it. And there can be downright fraud in, in a few instances. That's caught within a matter of weeks, not years later, after someone's absconded with it to a non-extradition country. Yeah. Oh, great. Well, let's also talk about, um, this is a point that when I bring it up as a constitutional conservative type person, people just kind of shrug their shoulders at it. But it's basically how the federal involvement, you know, whether it's testing, funding or academic curricula, it has failed to abide by the constitutional implication that education must remain in the domain of the state and local governments only versus or private mm -hmm. institutions. And, you know, the federal government was basically not supposed to be involved. I mean, that's the part you bring up whenever you're like, we got to get rid of it anyway, because it's unconstitutional and people just kind of blow their minds. Let's talk about that. What is what's your thought process behind that? Absolutely. The word education doesn't appear once in our Constitution. We're more likely to hear things like, well, the federal government historically or traditionally has had a role, baloney. There is no constitutionally sanctioned role for the federal government, period. It's not, it's not debatable. We have the 10th Amendment. Unless the federal government is granted the enumerated power over education, it does not exist, period. Now, what started changing, of course, is oh well there's such there's you know such a need there's an overriding national interest and of course James Madison you know heard the same sort of arguments because let's face it our early pres presidents including Madison all wanted just a little plot of land for for a national university and nope it's unless you have but they even said unless we amend the constitution, we have no authority to do that. That all changed after the Civil War, of course. But we have to get back to abiding by the 10th Amendment, which leaves all non-enumerated powers to the state and local governments. And let's face it, when it comes to education, there's nothing more local than, a, than an empowered parent, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. Well, and to private institutions and to some of those things, it's actually a huge help to help spur some competition. You know, it's kind of like what I heard during the election, whenever we would, if we could let the, the states run, we'd have 50 microcosms of, you know, best practices versus, you know, one great big, I mean, that's what they're kind of saying that we, why we need the Department of Federal Education is because we want, you know, kind of a, we want everyone to be educated the same, but really <laughs> that doesn't serve us very well to have every, everybody educated the same because we can't see best practices anywhere. You know, we can't, we can't see where it would work the best, but when we have local and state governments, we can, we can go, wow, look at how they're doing it over in Maine or look at how they're doing it in, in Arizona or something like that. It definitely would give us some competition so that we can learn best practices. Absolutely. And, and we're not used to thinking of you know, education and competition. Education is sort of warm and fluffy and competition sounds so mean and cutthroat. Uh, competition is supposed to bring out excellence. Competition may not make our lives easier, but it makes us better. And that's what we're seeing research. There's actually a significant body of research that is dedicated to this subject, what it reveals. And it, sh it shouldn't be a surprise. It's one of those things that, well, of course, that makes sense. What it reveals is that when any school has to compete for students and associated funding, they do better. Their students do better. They spend their money more wisely. It, it, just a whole host of outcomes. For example, um, class sizes are smaller. Your teacher salaries go up. Why? Because you don't have this monopoly and this 
sort of lackadaisical bloat. You have to stay sharp, lean and mean, and you have to really be out there looking at what the best practices are. What are other folks doing? And that's, again, I go back to as far back as Thomas Paine. That's why he said, and, and even Adam Smith, who are arguing that, yeah, you could give government assistance to families who are financially needy. The better thing is to give them the money and let them choose. Because once you start getting educators dependent upon government funding, where's the motivation to look at the new practices and be at the top of your game? So it's very interesting that competition brings out excellence. And there is a huge body of scientific research backing that up. Yeah. Well, and I kind of wanted to go back and maybe talk about, you know, we talked about the creation of the Department of Federal Education and how Mm -hmm. Carter accepted, you know, money from the largest teachers unions. Now that really is a common thread of of the fight against, you know, educational reform or educational choice is that a lot of these uh, politicians, regardless of where they are on the political spectrum, they want to be backed by those teachers unions. And it's causing some problems. I mean, for us to, I mean, they're almost being corrupted to keep things kind of in a pecking order. That's not the best for the kids. Do you have any thoughts on that? That kind of, I don't want to throw anyone under the bus, but. Oh, no, no. And that's, When you think of opposition to parental choice in education, one of the first issues that comes up are teachers unions. And again, I think of teacher union leadership because depending on when where you live, teachers are more or less free to decide whether or not to join a union. So be that as it may, teachers unions obviously have a lot of money that they've taken from a lot of teachers with or without express permission or or blessing to do so. And so they represent a huge political force. It's also interesting, of course, that during working hours, in many cases, they are paid to go out and lobby. They're not supposed to, you know, necessarily teachers aren't supposed to do this, but they have a lot more freedom to be down at the legislature, having, you know, our state legislatures, having rallies, meeting with lawmakers. That's why, you know, parents, grandparents, these grassroots activists, we have to be organized, use technology for good. I mean, with emails and social media and making sure that we're fighting for our rights in education. And I look at what the teachers unions do and they're very organized. We should take some pages out of their book, you know, in terms of social media and contact with lawmakers and really fight. Yeah. That said, another thing that we have to fight for, what's called paycheck protection. Nobody should have, and, and it's National Employee Freedom Week, ironically enough. No one should have the fruits of their hard earned labor taken without their permission. No one should be forced to join any organization without their express consent. Um, it's a violation of our basic First Amendment rights. So we also need to fight for right to work policies teacher choice. That's why parental choice, teacher choice goes hand in hand with parental choice. And so we have to work with our really great, dedicated, hardworking teachers who want students to succeed and don't have a problem with school choice, love freedom, you know, want children to succeed in the best educational setting possible. So those are all issues that we have to work on together. But to think that teachers unions or school board unions, administrators unions, and even superintendents unions just support one side of the aisle. No, there are a lot of a lot of people think that Republicans are, you know, just automatically pro parental choice. That is not the case. And it's not the case that folks who are Democrats are opposed to parental choice. We have to work with our lawmakers on both sides of the aisle to really ensure parents' rights over children's education and upbringing. Yeah. That's great. Well, and I want to get into how we can organize ourselves and get more parental involvement, what you think we can do as a local grassroots type community to see this expansion in choice and all of that with education. But I did want to hit the last point. I feel like we've kind of talked about it, but the last failure that you have listed is that most of all, the central government's persuasive meddling in education has failed the American school children and their parents. Is there anything you feel like we've left out of our discussion that might fall under that topic? Well, I think certainly Common Core is the most obvious one, but what we have to realize is that Common Core is just the latest iteration. Way back in the day, 
just before the U.S. Department of Education uh, was approved, the federal government was saying, all right, had a host of education programs, making all these promises. By 1984, all Americans are going to be literate. You know, 1984 came and went, and that's not, we're not even close. And then in both the Bill Clinton years and first George Bush years, uh, Goals 2000, where that started the, you know, the testing, you know, the federal government put its toe in the water about testing. Um, and we were going to have, you know, by the year 2000, we're going to have at least a 90 percent high school graduation rate. And we're going to be world leaders in math and science. Well, 2000 came and went and we're not even close to either of those goals. Then we had George Bush, number two, and we had the No Child Left Behind years. By 2014, we're supposed to have 100% student proficiency in math and reading. Again, we are not even close to that. So Common Core was just a natural, in a sense, outgrowth of that. All these promises, federal government can't deliver because it boils down to, to this. D.C. does not know best. It is absolutely impossible for some far off, don't want to begin depending on where you live, a handful of bureaucrats to know what is best for more than 50 million school children from coast to coast. It's just impossible. So we have to take power back and we have to stop the thinking that, well, I'm a good parent, but we need the federal government because of all of those bad parents out there. <laughs> That's one thing I encounter. Yes, you know, there are some parents who by any objective measure may not be good parents. That is not the vast majority of parents in America. And so I think we have to put our trust in parents because trust in government, particularly far off government, has not worked and it's not going to work. Yeah. Well, and I did want to kind of make a comment on what you just said. I, you know, I've been in the school choice movement for years. That's kind of where I started out. And, and that's why I started this podcast, because I went from being part of a charter school to being part of virtual school to be more independent homeschooling. You know, I've, I've totally my paradigm has completely shifted. But and I've seen that with other parents, too, that once they get involved, once they feel like they have a choice in their education, whether it's the local charter school, whether it's being able to have access to their tax dollars, wh whether it's to get a tax break because of their kids' education, all of a sudden it makes them stand up and like look at their situation and they're a lot more involved. I mean, I've even seen this in the inner city where we have a, you know, the single mom who is working three jobs or all of a sudden once they're given an opportunity to have something different, then they get more involved. Then they become educational experts in the fact of, what's best for their child and what's available around them. I mean, when there's no educational choice, parents kind of sit back and they let the government kind of do whatever they want. But that's where I feel like we as homeschoolers or as people who want that <laughs> uh, freedom, independence, you know, whatever, we do need to get involved to make sure other people do have a choice because it creates less apathy in everybody. That is absolutely right. Because so many times you'll hear opponents of parental choice talk about, well, if parents are more involved and, you know, they talk about the importance of parental involvement. Well, yes, it's important to be involved, but they mean something very different than I think we mean. Basically, parental involvement means be a good booster at the bake sale. Where parental choice and parental involvement really matters is right at the beginning. Your choice of not just where your child goes to school, but how your child is going to be educated. That's why I don't want to talk about school choice. There should be a whole host of more options for parents and their children. So that's when parental choice matters. And you're absolutely right. I remember stories you were talking that Virginia Walden Ford told years ago. And she is one of the biggest advocates, civil rights leader, advocates for parental choice in education. And she was talking about the DC Opportunity Scholarship Program. And she was talking about, you know, a little, I think, I can't remember if it was a little boy or a little girl, but this child came up with his application for the DC Scholarship Program. Dad was looking a little scruffy, obviously had some addiction issues and problems. A year later, this child comes back with his dad, unrecognizable. This dad realized that I've got to be a good example for my child and my child needs me to fill out the application, to pick this great private school. And I now have skin in the game, literally. It turned a whole, not just a child's life around, but a family's life yeah. around. That's what, that's what parental choice can do. 
I've actually read stories too, where mothers all of a sudden go back to school themselves when they have Mm -hmm. an opportunity. I mean, like I said, the single mom who is working three jobs all of a sudden sees that how important this education is and it starts to improve her life and not just their child. So that's great. Let's maybe talk about some positive things of how parents can be involved um, more so than, you know, just the bake sale or putting up the (laughs) bulletin board in the back of the classroom. What are some really effective things that parents can do that help create a positive change in education? I think one of the first things you can do is there are so many parents who are involved. You can't be on social media without get involved with a, a group that, you know, if you're homeschooling, public charter schools, your district public school choice, your your private school choice, no matter what your niche may be, go online and find others like you. Get educated about the issues and testing. The, the next thing you can do is once you're together with other parents, you know, we're getting getting ready for, you know, the legislative season coming up in the new year, the tail end of this year. What laws are being introduced? Start familiarizing yourself with your state legislature's, you know, bill tracking system, start an email group, start a phone chain, start a Twitter chain, um, get Twitter accounts out, you know, parents for choice, come up with a name, you know, that you all agree with and put someone in charge of one thing. Don't make it, don't make the perfect, the enemy of the good. Who's going to tweet on, you know, the student privacy issues, what bills are going to affecting student privacy, what bills are affecting, you know, funding or testing or choices, get together, everybody take a piece, a piece of the pie, piece of the puzzle, because we're all so busy. No one person can do it alone. Don't reinvent the wheel, work together. And you'll be amazed at how lawmakers are going to respond. You may not get everything you like first year out, but be a force to be reckoned with. Also go down if you can see what people are available to go down and testify or at least attend legislative hearings, talk to lawmakers. There's usually a legislator day. Go talk to legislators, sponsor a legislator, you know, meet the parents day. Something else you can do is school choice week is coming up. It's always the last week of January, the beginning of February. Start thinking of activities to do now. Go to nationalschoolchoiceweek.org. There is a whole host of things. You're not alone. And I have to tell you that a former state lawmaker shared a story with me years ago. And she said, yes, Obviously, as a state lawmaker, we are barraged um, with you know emails, phone calls, so on and so forth. She said, we know most of these communications are from groups that you just push the button. These aren't necessarily individuals who are taking time out of their day. She said, when we hear from a parent who actually picks up the phone or sends us an email, not doing one of these robocalls or something, blast emails, she said, we have a formula. For every one parent who contacts us, we know there are six people behind them who are working jobs, taking care of their families, who couldn't do it, but are absolutely behind them. So remember that old shampoo commercial, you know, she told two friends and then she told two friends, so on and so forth. There's an exponential number of people that lawmakers know are behind just one phone call from parents, also grandparents, guardians, aunts, uncles, get involved. It it does make a difference. It doesn't happen overnight. But I'm, I'm very proud to say that not only do we support good people running for office, we have to take people out. And there was a, a lawmaker here in Arizona who did not stand with parents, he, even though he claimed he did, to oppose common core and protect privacy, didn't live up to what he said, and very popular, but we got him voted out of office. The tide is definitely changing. More than half the states in the country now have non-public school choice. Homeschooling, we've got to fight for homeschooling and virtual schooling and public school choice, be it district and charter. We're all, no matter where we choose to send our children to school or how we choose to educate our kids, let's all work together and not in fight because we are all in it together fighting for each other's rights to educate our kids. Yeah. Well, and I feel like I've gone kind of long here, but we did talk about before we started recording kind of the homeschooling movement. And I kind of pose the question, you know, when we look at the homeschooling testing that they're testing, you know, at the 80, 86, the high 80s of doing so well versus the public school kid and they're in the 50 range, why aren't we following kind of that uh, homespun education and trying to implement that more into our public choice policy 
you had some great comments about that and I can't remember what they exactly were, but give us well, your take you know, on it. The, the one great thing about home education and then the the, the voluntary associations, because my, my friends who homes will talk about the great co-ops that they're in and the great resources. When you start building it, well, I think first and foremost, since homeschooling is not a system. Education is personal and individual to every child, which goes completely against the notion that we have. And we're trying to make this sort of factory model notion of education work. A factory model would work if all children were cookie cutters of each other. Of course, they're not. So the system that we're trying to reform from within and contort and get to change and respond, you know, be innovative. It's a factory model. You're never going to get the kind of really loving, personalized education than you get from mom and dad or family members, grandma, grandpa, and so forth. I think that's what really makes the difference. Education is so personal to every child. And what I love hearing from my friends who have homeschooled is that we're so glad to have our, our day back. We don't have to get up at oh dark 30 in the morning, rush, 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 rush. We can have family meals together. We can get through lessons in a fraction of the time, even if you have to spend a little bit more time on one subject with one child than another. You can make those accommodations. And then the extracurricular enrichment activities, you're doing a history lesson, you can go to the history museum or you can do you know, a science lesson. You can go out and do all these really great tailored extracurricular activities. So I love all that. And again, it comes down to the personalization. I think that's why you're seeing the scores the way that they are. I think home educators, moms and dads are not told how to teach. They're not teaching to a test because so many of our great hardworking teachers, we have all these standards and curricula that they never had a hand in developing. It was all politicians. So when you have educators, and when I say that, I'm including kids first educators who are their parents, developing the curricula and the content, it just works out better. Yeah. And that's, I think the homeschooling movement needs to get behind the school choice advocacy in um, pushing that forward. You know, that we, we're, we're not just, uh, their eyes aren't going to glaze over and give us a uh, 30% less because our, you know, attention or <laughs> IQ points or whatever, whatever, however you said it before, but, <laughs> but that, that we are a force to be reckoned with. And that if, especially if we get together and get, with the other groups and really work together, I think that we could move the needle. Let's maybe talk about what some long-term goals are, things that you see in the horizon, and we'll kind of end with that kind of thing. Absolutely. What I see in the horizon is that basically the evidence is too great to ignore. The justice of the movement is too great to ignore, that there will always be opponents, but too many parents are rightfully demanding their, their God-given rights uh, to educate and raise their children. And what we're seeing now, this is now becoming intergenerational. As I, as I said, Arizona, we are now in our third generation of children who are using our first tax credit scholarship program. So the notion that this is something bad, all the list of horribles that were supposed to have happened, haven't happened. In fact, we've, Arizona is home to more top ranked public high schools than I, I think almost any other state, certainly more in the top 25. So freedom, the unde, you know unalienable rights of parents to educate their children is undeniable. And I think more and more parents are coming, are, are seeing how important it is. And I think if there's a silver lining with Common Core is that the government so far overreached into our, our children's classrooms, our children's upbringing, that you know, parents now know it is not okay. Government is not benign. We have to fight for our rights. And I think more and more school choice programs, parental choice programs are coming on board. And I, we have to just expand parents' rights as far as we can. 
when there's horrible things that happen like that, you know, everyone uh, is throwing up their hands and thinking that it's over. But really, that's just the beginning because all of a sudden people wake up. This is not what we signed up for. And that's what I find exciting. When I talk to young people, I'm I'm an older mom. so <laughs> But I, when I talk to young people, they are fully engaged with what is going on. And I can see the future mm-hmm. generations, they aren't going to just be thrown in whatever box we feel, you know, as a public education system is available. They want to know what their options are. And they're very aware of those things. I'm really excited about it myself. But I agree. And in fact, we hear a lot of bad things about millennials and all that younger generation. One of the great things is, is they are some of the strongest supporters of options. They've been the beneficiary of options. They support more options. So I think generationally that the momentum is too big, too much to stop. Yeah, definitely. They're definitely better educated in their options too. So, but before we say goodbye, do you have any final parting words for our listeners and then give us your contact information, how we can go find all of your, you've got 40 plus writings of public policy that you've helped with and all of that. I want to connect them to that. Oh, well, thank you so much. I would say don't lose hope. You're not alone. There are so many of us out there, especially with social media. There are ways that we can share ideas, troubleshoot. But again, this is for parents' rights in a whole. It's not just school choice. This is a parents' rights issue. We're on the same side. Let's work together and help each other. There will be times we may not agree on a particular, but we're still friends fighting the good fight. And if you know you want to want to learn more, you can find my work and my colleagues' great work at independent.org. And I'm on social media, Facebook, Vicki E. Alger PhD. And that's also my Twitter handle, Vicki E. Alger PhD. That's great. Well, and like I said, you know, I've scanned through all of her stuff. She's got all kinds of great videos that she's been part of different programs, a lot of commentary and wonderful things on her website, as well as her great book called Failure, The Federal Miseducation of America's Children. Uh, Definitely check it out. Once again, her website too is independent.org that you can find out more about her. However, we're going to be sure to link all that information that we've discussed today on our website as well. But thank you so much, Vicki, for coming on and joining us and lighting our minds on fire on this important topic of education. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you for inviting me. And I want to thank you for all the work you do. I want to thank your listeners for all the work they do, because everything we do together makes education better for our children and their children. Thank you for listening to The Luminous Mind. To learn more about Vicki Alger, go to our show notes at luminousmind.net. Be sure to become a subscriber to our free email list. Then check out the services tab to see how we can continue to assist you, our fire starters. Also, to help us continue production of illuminating content, go to the Sponsor tab at theluminousmind.net for more information on sponsorship and affiliate programs. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, Google+, Pinterest, and now Instagram. Get our free audio content by subscribing on YouTube, iTunes, and Stitcher. To help us grow, consider these easy ways. Tell your friends about us, leave us a review, share our content, Tell us how we can help you so together we can continue to light minds on fire and change the paradigm of education. 